I'm here today with Professor John Coleman. John is a professor of medicine at the University of Melbourne. And I'm talking with John today about his experience with AFib ablation. And we're gonna start off by asking John a little bit about how the procedure has evolved. I know you've been doing AFib ablation for a long time. Tell me a little bit about what's changed over the last 10 years and what's the rationale for the procedure and how it's changed over time. It has certainly been a very exciting time to be in electrophysiology the last 10 years with a sort of evolution of, of change in AF ablation. And as you recall, back then, um, really under the, the pioneering work of, of the group in Bordeaux and Professor Hussiger, we were chasing these foci down uh, the pulmonary veins. So we understood at that time that the triggers to AF originated within the pulmonary veins and that if you could find and eliminate those triggers that you could actually cure patients at least with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And so the early approach was to go searching for each one of those triggers, sometimes two to four centimetres down the veins. And you know, we quickly learned, and, and although the, the early experience was with that, and if you look at some of the early publications, they were certainly extremely encouraging. We learned over time that actually this was not the ideal approach to the technique, um, both because it was really not possible to find all of those triggers. Sometimes they weren't active at a given time during the procedure, and also because of, of what we learned about the risks of ablating deep within veins. and and the risks of stenosing pulmonary veins, which, which is a real risk and, and obviously uh, a very, very difficult problem to deal with. So the procedure evolved to one of, rather than trying to find each of the triggers, actually trying to simply isolate that electrical tissue from the rest of the atrium. And the, the initial approach to that was what was so-called segmental isolation, where perhaps a little bit inside the vein, one tried to uh, disconnect each of the muscle strands uh, from the left atrial tissue. Um, and this often required maybe 50%, 70% circumferential ablation. and is an approach that, that is still used in some labs for purely paroxysmal AF in people with normal hearts. But it evolved, I think, further uh, beyond that to one of proximal uh, circumferential isolation where much of the ablation is done in the posterior left atrial wall and for a number of years there was a, a debate and discussion as to whether it was actually important to electrically isolate the vein or whether it was enough to simply modify that region electroanatomically was the word uh, people used um, but but it's really very clear today that the that the goal must be isolation of that tissue the advantage of doing it in the uh, proximally and circumferentially within the left atrium is of course that the risk of pulmonary vein stenosis becomes almost non-existent if, if one is sufficiently proximal. And I think it's also important to be aware that many of the triggers really are in that proximal or antral region of the vein, in that sort of funnel between the vein and left atrial musculature. And, and, and I think that was a notion pioneered by a number of people, and Andrea Natali was, was certainly prominent amongst those. So today, for uh, patients with, with very symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, I think this, this is a really good procedure, uh, proximal circumferential isolation. There's still some discussion as to whether this should be done uh, four veins individually, uh, or whether it's better to isolate the left and the right uh, veins on block. And, and there are uh, pros and cons of either approach. I think what we're seeing is um, from a single procedure, the success rates are probably in the vicinity of, of 60% perhaps, that the biggest problem that we face and continue to face is um, continued isolation is, is a way of achieving isolation where there isn't recurrence of conduction into the vein. And uh, with the current technology, al although I think we're getting better at it and, and some of the newer technologies, uh, contact pressure may, may be helpful, uh, nevertheless, this is the m far and away the most common reason uh, 
that patients have recurrence is that although you've isolated the veins at the time of the procedure, within the next few days, weeks or even months, that the veins reconnect and the AF recurs. And in those patients, uh, if they come back for a second procedure, and again, we're talking now about the paroxysmal patient, perhaps mid-50s with a sort of bell-shaped curve around uh, that age group without tremendously much in the way of structural heart disease, you know, I think we're achieving success rates in the vicinity of 85% of around the 12-month mark. There, there are some emerging data looking at five-year um, outcomes and, well, far and away the majority of recurrences occur um, within the first 12 months. There is an ongoing late recurrence rate that people have put at between 3 and 5 per cent per year over the next years to out to five years. And one can speculate about the reasons. Uh, no doubt pulmonary vein reconnection is still important even at that late stage, but there may be evolution of substrate or abnormality with, within the chamber of the atrium. John, um, let me ask you a question. When you talk to patients or would have cardiologists talk to patients, when you tell them success, what do you mean by success and how do you monitor these patients and what you tell the patients the risk of the procedure are because we, we need to have that sort of balance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, when we're taking that, that patient who, who has the younger patient, as I say, mid-50s, without a lot in the way of structural heart disease, what we're saying to them is that, that there's around an 85% success rate, but that about a third of patients um, will require two procedures to get to that point. Um, that that's really a 12-month success rate. We tell them that there is this uh, ongoing late risk of recurrence. On the other side of the equation are the risks, and certainly with this procedure, we're now seeing risks that we and complications that we've never before seen to any significant extent in uh, certainly with SVT ablation. Those risks uh, include a significant risk of thromboembolic events, stroke, TIA. Um, pulmonary vein stenosis we talked about, which, which is uh, perhaps becoming more uh, less common with proximal isolation, uh, very feared comp uh, complication of atrioesophageal fistula, uh, tamponade, uh, you know, around about 1% in, in many series. What we're saying to those uh, patients, perhaps younger, is we're quoting them a 1% to 2% risk of one of those major complications. But it's fair to say that many of the studies that are published, uh, which have taken perhaps a broader spectrum of patients, older patients, patients with structural heart disease, and, and more advanced ablation procedures with ablation that's performed uh, perhaps linear ablation, ablation of fractionated electrograms have included uh, major complication rates in the vicinity of 4%. The, the, the ongoing guidelines, the Heart Rhythm Society guidelines, are that the indication for this procedure is highly symptomatic patients, the majority of whom have failed at least one antiarrhythmic medicine, medication. And, and we really do focus patients' attention on what they aim to achieve in terms of their improvement in quality of life and make sure that they're very aware that there is this potential very significant uh, downside. Thank you, John. That was an excellent overview of how the procedure has evolved over the last uh, decade or so and which patients are appropriate candidates and what we can expect in terms of both results and complications. Thanks. Thanks, Ken.